Okay, so welcome and thanks for this opportunity to be here and present something. Probably after yesterday evening and after a few weeks of uh, preparation of this conference, it will be brief course of Esperanto or Russian English. So at the beginning, something about me, but I will be very descriptive because I cannot see it on the screen. Okay, that's me. So I'm a researcher, a researcher and educator. I'm working here in this faculty at the Department of Theoretic, Theoretic, Theoretical Geodesy and Geoinformatics. And I'm working with cultural heritage for more than 20 years. I'm working in the Middle East, Africa, Central America. Since 2017, I'm working with LiDAR data. We start with the Pakunam LiDAR initiative. It was the biggest archaeological LiDAR project at the world at the time. I am also the member of the Slovak user group and I like the open source. So first about the LiDAR in Slovakia, but I think that it was introduced by uh, my colleagues. We have really nice density of the LiDAR in Slovakia. It is something between eight and 40 points per square meter. Usually it is around 20 points per square meter. The accuracy is also really nice, and what I really like that the LiDAR have also the classification, mainly for the, for the ground, but almost every part of the Slovak LiDAR have also for the non-ground feature. And what is also really nice from our state authority that the, those data are completely free uh, in a raw form like the point cloud, but also like digital elevation model. Uh, so first I will start with the point cloud. I was really happy with the introducing of point clouds to QGIS. I think it was in the version 3.18. For instance, you can use the point clouds to work with the public relations and you can mix the historical maps, historical plans with those kind of modern data. This was for the people from my city it is a combination of the plants from 17th century, uh, the combination of the point clouds and the RL imagery from 20th century and so and so. But you can also use uh, those point clouds uh, for the practical task. For instance, in my city, it was the legend about that we have the leaning tower and maybe it is the biggest uh, inclination in Slovakia. So I used the LiDAR point cloud data uh, for some analysis and I came to conclusion that our uh, church ta tower is pretty straight. Uh, this was done in the cloud compare, but then also we make the 3D model of the tower by uh, drone with the geodetic GPS and so and so. And this is the combination in QGIS, the combination of the LiDAR data and the photogrammetric point cloud. So uh, I really like to work with those kind of data. But my main work is about the digital elevation model processing. Because the density of Slovak LiDAR is pretty nice, uh, I can go to the resolution 25 centimeter per pixel. So I made for the whole Slovakia this kind of digital elevation model. Uh, for instance, uh, about the methodology, we have really nice density. We have really nice uh, points of last let return, but 40% of Slovakia is forested area. So there are the parts when the 70% uh, of the points were from the ground. But also there are the parts with the forested area that only few percent of the points reach the ground. So for this reason, I'm using the linear interpolation for the digital elevation models. I know that those images are really shady and the, probably from the rear part is the blob or something like that, but we are well, using a lot of the vis visual interpretation and if I'm doing on uh, visual in interpretation, I want to see the triangles. I want to see the artificial artifacts because then I know that uh, I have no information from the area. 
And with another kind of uh, interpolation, you can have the smooth, smoother, nicer data, but then you realize that you are interpreting something what is not there. Also, the advantages of QGIS. For instance, really nice feature is on-fly hillshade. Uh, what I really like is on-fly contours, because one of the core developer of the QGIS is from Slovakia, Martin Dobiaš. I asked him in the pub for a few bottles of the wine if, she, if he can prepare the on-fly contours to the QGIS, and for me it is really useful uh, tool, so thanks, Martin. But for instance, I also use or we use with the cultural heritage also the elevation profiles. It was also the really nice work during the last three or four years. Uh, I think that this was developed by Niall Davison. And another usage of the digital elevation model, for instance, we have now the two generations of the LiDAR data. Uh, one is from around 2017, 18. Second one started, I think, that uh, last year. And here is the castle, castle Tematin. And maybe you can uh, focus to uh, this part. This castle is under the heavy restoration of volunteers. So maybe you can see the difference between two generations of the LiDAR. If you will subtract those digital elevation model, you can highlight what was the art during the reconstruction, what was the clean because of the reconstruction. And for instance, you can make the volumetric calculation, how much of the stones they use, how big amount of the work was used. Uh, another uh, example of the digital elevation model in uh, cultural heritage, it, this is the another castle. Also, I made the uh, difference model and they weren't so big changes in the castle, but maybe you can see there the landslide. And you can monitor the culture, cultural heritage with multiple generation of the LiDAR for this kind of things, the landslides, and things are what, are the, what are dangerous for the cultural heritage. This is the, another example, church in, uh, in okay, somewhere in uh, Western Slovakia, in Halusice. And also the problem with the erosion, but also the typical problem of the cultural heritage, and this is the pressure of the civilization. Close to this church is village. People are building houses. They are getting closer and closer to this side. So if you have this kind of models, you can see that something appears, something disappears. So you can also use multiple generation of digital elevation model for monitoring this kind of treats. My biggest work is the, I call it integrated visualization. Uh, in the cultural heritage, there are many ways how to visualize the LiDAR. Few are for the subtile linear feature, few are for the big features and so and so. And for instance, uh, during the Guatemala project, I realized that it can be more than 40 or 20 ways how to visualize the digital elevation model. So I trying to make something uh, what is integrated to one visualization. And I'm using the different prin uh, principles, like uh, different topographic scales from five meters to 30 meters different color-coded expression of curvature or long period topo feature, uh, like local dominance. Then we have also the short period uh, topographical feature, so I'm using the things like the sky view factor and so and so. And of course, it is not completely my work. Uh, as somebody told today or yesterday, we are staying the sh on the shoulders of the giants, so this work started in the Guatemala. If you working with LiDAR and cultural heritage, I have to really recommend the work of the Giga Kokail and people from Slovenia. They are the cutting edge in the visualization of the LiDAR data. Also, a lot of work on my own scripts, a lot of usage of, I'm trying to stay on the, 
open source or free uh, stack during the processing of the LIDAR. LIDAR. So GDAL, QGIS, whitebox tools, and so and so. Here are the overview of my favorite tools uh, from QGIS. And because of these tools, I was able to get the visualization of all Slovakia. So my favorite are blending modes, multiply, dark, and dodge, and so and so. You can combine the colors from the different layers. Uh, for me, the best tool is convert map to raster. You will mix the combination of the visualization of the color coding and transparencies and blending modes. And then, then you can use these tools to bake the map to one layer. And for instance, I was also really happy with uh, headless QGIS. Uh, I think that it was introduced four years ago or something like that. And you can call the QGIS and the processing tools from the QGIS in your scripts. You can call it externally and so and so. It was a big effort. If it is worth it, from my point of view, probably yes, but you probably cannot see it. For instance, we have the or overlap with the Czech Republic with the LiDAR data. Here is one fortress from the Czech Republic on the Czech data. This is the visualization of the, our uh, provider of the LiDAR data. And this is the same area with the very high resolution, 25 centimeters per pixel and special visualization. And uh, the difference is pretty big. Also, another comparison is with the Poland. Also, we have some, some overlaps at the border. And if we use this high resolution data, you can see, clearly see much time more. Okay, then uh, for special cases, this was work for the whole area of the Slovakia. For special cases uh, like the old monasteries, uh, old military cemeteries, churches, I'm trying to go to the resolution 10 centimeter per pixel. It is far beyond the limit of the LiDAR, because if you have density around 20, 30 points per square meter, 10 meter is too much, but I have different motivation for it. And maybe our main motivation is, uh, as I said, the data from Slovak Republic have the classification. But this classification was made by the automats or semi-automatic plug uh, tools. And for instance, uh, if we are talking about the ruins, about the remains of the building, for those kind of algorithm, the ruins are not the buildings, because buildings for the algorithm are the walls and the rooftops and so and so. So many times the data are classified in the different classification uh, classes. So for instance, this is the example of the digital elevation model making, making, made from the ground and building, those two most famous classes in the LiDAR data. And here is the combination of the ground data, building, other and low vegetation. And my advice for people who are working with cultural heritage or with the ruins, try to use also the another classification classes for the producing of digital elevation model. You can, of, of course, you can reclassify, reclassify those data, but I think that it is time consuming, complicated. Sometimes it's easier to make uh, the scripts and they will process all of these classes to one picture. Another work are the interactive 3D visualization. We are making this 3D visualization also from, for uh, public relations, and we are working on those visualizations with the Monument Board of Slovakia. If you have time, internet, put to the Google, the Sketchfab, Slovakia, Hillfort, and you can see, I think there are 30 or 40 of the 3D models, interactive 3D models. You can click to the parts of the model and you will have the description, of course, in the Slovak language, but you will see the pictures. Okay, now some few case studies. Uh, for instance, why is this talk called as Archaeology of the Invisible? 
Could you see something there? There is something with, uh, I think this is the road, this is the slope, and so and so. But if you will use the specialized uh, visualization, you can see something like this. This is the, so far the biggest structure what we found in the Slova Glider. It has 600 meters diameter. Okay, you cannot see it on this data projector, but it is there and it is big. Also, we made the ground routing and validation by the geophysic. We found uh, really weird uh, big structures like with the 60, 60 meter gates, a lot of ditches and so and so. And we are pretty sure that it is maybe seven and a half thousand years old or maybe three and a half uh, thousand years old from the Bronze Age. And that's the one of the disadvantages of the leader. The leader will provide the spatial information about the shapes and features, but you will not have the information about the dating, about the period of this feature. So for uh, those kind of things, it is necessary to have the methods of ground routing, like the pedestrian survey or the metal detectors. So, for instance, we weren't able to find nothing metallic at that site. So, for sure, it is not the Bronze Age era. For sure, it is seven and a half thousand year old structure. Uh, we have several examples of this kind of cross validation between the LiDAR and the geophysic. So, uh, also, we made the book about it. It is uh, for free to download. Again, in the Slovak language, but summary is in the English language. Description of the picture is in the English language. So you can download it for free. Another case study, what can put the problematic of the LiDAR and benefits for the cultural heritage to the scale, is the, uh, our research in Tribeche Mountains. The size of the area is around 260 kilometers. Uh, till either we know from the data maybe 60 features. Uh, after the LiDAR, we discovered really complex systems of the terraces, of the roads, of the ramparts, uh, of the many things, of the historical fields. Uh, we don't know about these terraces, if they are the field terraces or settlement terraces. And after the LiDAR, now we have more than 11,000 features at this area. So compare this step for around 40 features to 11,000. And maybe to put it to the perspective, if we will use the area of the Slovakia, around 50,000 square kilometers, we will add the forest cover, because forest is conserving the topographical feature in the LiDAR. Then we came to estimation that we have maybe two million features, archaeological features in the library in Slovakia. What is the problem that we have the 16th archaeologist would work on the monument board for those two million features? Uh, and this is the, another use case. Uh, those data, I will talk, it about, talk about it later, are not provided for free for specific reasons. But I provide this data to the National Monument Board of the Slovak Republic. They are building the new uh, national database called Monument Information System, PAMIS. By coincidence, they start to build this database at the same time, like the LIDAR was accessible in Slovakia. And for instance, I'm pretty happy that we, me and Alexandra, the co-author of this publication, convinced the Monument Board of Slovakia to go completely with the QGIS solution. So uh, the Monument Board is using the things like the merging maps, Q field and QGIS. And they are recording the data about the sites uh, and it is based on the LiDAR they add several hundreds or thousands records to the national database because of this combination. 
Okay, then another last one case study. Still, we are somewhere in the border of the landscape archaeology and landscape ecology. For instance, we were able to identify really old uh, field systems. Maybe they are from the Celtic time, maybe they are from the Bronze Age. And I'm pretty happy for this kind of feature because for me it's not necessary to see the big uh, fortress somewhere in the forest. But to make the analysis about the sustainability, how big uh, area they were, do in how big area they were doing the agricultural job, if it was sustainable for the feeding of the people at the side, and so and so. And now I'm going to the conclusion. What else? What we can see? We can see many, many, many of things. For instance, those are also you know probably the Stonehenge, uh, but maybe you heard about the rondel. Rondels are the features like Stonehenge, but they are 2,000 uh, years older, and we were able to identify them in the later data. Also, like I told, fortified sites. You can see the reconstruction of those sites. For instance, this is the border city in the border of the Hungarian Slovak Republic, the big fortress in uh, Komarno. Here you can see how memory of the landscape is working. This is the city Nové Zámky, and in the core of this city was big fortress built, I think, 400 years ago, but 200 years ago was completely destroyed. But you can see still, you can still see clearly the outlines of the fortress there. This is, for instance, from Bratislava, Napoleon era war. Uh, these are the burial mounds. We were able to identify the system, the maybe 90 kilometer long system of burial mounds in Eastern Slovakia. Uh, for instance, we can also see the old road systems and you can see now the connections between the sites, between the villages and so and so. I was pretty happy that we were able to identify the Roman roads in Slovakia in Lider. And a lot of other things like mining areas. This is the maybe two kilometers in diameter site for the mining of the gold, a few thousand years old. And what I'm pretty happy is that we are able to identify the landscape. Here is the part of the Moravia River, and you can see nicely the memory of the landscape, how the river were shifted during the time. Uh, here is the example from the Tatra, and why it is so important for us. Because every time you have to think about the context. If you will find something in archaeological in the data, you have to still think about the landscape context, why it was there, why the people were building the structures there, and so. Okay. So at the end, other cooperations. Uh, this slider data start to use the Geological Institute of the Dionysius Tour. It is our national geological institute. It is for monitoring of the landslides. Also now those data are used for the remapping of the river streams because the LIDAR data bring the new problem. That the, the, uh, we have the much more accurate the LIDAR maps of the rivers than the river maps of the rivers. Uh, for instance, also we were working with, uh, or we are working with the Institute of Landscape Ecology with the application like the Tilliage direction of analysis of plowing directions and so and so. It is beca important because of the erosion. And for the conclusion, I have the problem with this data. I really like the open data and open access data, but those data are killing the archaeological features. Uh, because in those uh, integrated visualization, you can uh, see two times more than in the classical visualization. Uh, for instance, here is the example. It was also for the public relations. We published this model of this uh, hill fort, 
but by accident, we published also the another hill fort where there was not visible in the classical data. This site was looted within the two weeks. And looting is the big problem, because if you will use the detectors, and if you will take out the metal things from the ground, you will destroy the context of the, of the things. So I have the big problem that I have this data. I think that this data are really useful also for another field of work, but I cannot share those data. For instance, one of the solutions is citizen science. Uh, we work with the people from the monument board in the Banska Bystrica uh, municipality. We are using the merging maps for the data validation. And final conclusion, LIDAR is big. For me, LIDAR is also easy. Only one thing for me is complicated on the LIDAR, and it is the classification of the data. Rest of the work with the LIDAR, especially because the effort of the Q QGIS developers, uh, it is really, work, really easy to work with them. Maybe why this uh, presentation was, told, uh, was called the two smoking laptops. For me, at the beginning, it was the DIY project. I started with those data during the pandemic on the two laptops, one is there. Uh, my scripts are able to process five square kilometers of data per 10 minutes. So it was around uh, seven days of computing, 70 days of the computing. And now we have the, maybe the best LiDAR data uh, from cultural heritage perspective in the Europe, but the cost of the electricity was 800 euros for me. And another point of conclusion, LiDAR is just a supplementary layer. Here is, ah, you cannot see nothing, but here is the example how on the RL imagery, you can nicely see the clear remains of some old village. It is based on the, based on the crop mark and vegetation marks in LiDAR, because LiDAR, LiDAR is also working only with the height, the terrain, ter terrain height. You can see nothing, so still from my point of view, the LiDAR is only one layer to knowledge, to archaeological knowledge. Maybe time for the cross-border cooperation. The countries around the Slovakia have the LiDAR. Maybe it's time to merge them and uh, to make the seamless visualization for the archaeologists. Especially, for instance, this system of the burial mounts. I'm pretty sure that this system is not ending in the border of Slovakia. I think that the system is continuing in the Poland side. And also maybe about how LIDAR shift our work. Uh, Alexandra one, one day told that before the LIDAR, we have the wrist pain from the machete. Now we have the wrist pain from the computer mouse. And it is really big problem for us. Maybe AI will solve it, but I'm a bit skeptical. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. This is the Slovakia Karst. And thank you for coming. Questions? We have like two minutes for questions. Uh, it was actually interesting to hear that your estimation about the two million of archaeological potential of valuable locations you identified. Actually, what is the criterion from prioritizing of the importance of those areas you already managed to map somehow to make sure that those are the, really the locations which deserve certain type of protection, considering the fact that you have limited capacities? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have some sort of... Uh, uh, rules how to prioritize those uh, valuable locations? The answer will be complicated because uh, from the monument board point of view, everything what is older than Second World War is part of the cultural heritage. But from scientific point of view, uh, things what are on the places what the, where you are, except uh, when you are know that those kind of things will be there. 
they are not so interesting. Interesting feature are the things on the totally unexpected locations, and those kind of features are bringing the new knowledge. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, that's all for this conference. I hope you enjoyed, and good luck.